I'm flipping burgers in a McDonald's restaurant in Milford, Massachusetts, when my boss Pam grabs me and pulls me into the walk-in cooler. She has a question to ask me. She tells me that our colleague Lisa is engaged to be married, and Pam is planning the bachelorette party in the break room of the McDonald's on Saturday. And she asks me to be the stripper for the bachelorette party. <laughs> and I say yes, right away, for two reasons. One is I'm 20 years old, which means I can only see about 10 seconds in front of me at any one time. So I have no idea what this yes is ultimately going to mean to me. But more importantly, I say yes because I'm not the kind of guy who gets girls by the way he looks. Proximity is my strategy. I stand as close as possible to a girl that I'm interested in for as long as possible, and I just wear away. I am love's version of erosion, and it works sometimes. I get dates. But this time, apparently someone, Pam, and theoretically some other women, are interested in the way I look. And I'm sort of thrilled by that. But I tell Pam I don't want to get all the way naked. And she says, we do not want that either. <laughs> she says, I'm going to get you a thong. And I say, great. I have no idea what a thong is or actually what a bachelorette party is either, but I am excited. So on Saturday night, I'm in the back hall of that McDonald's, and Pam is giving me that thong. I'm seeing it for the first time. A thong for at least the guy is sandwich bag with two strings attached to it. She tells me to put it on underneath my McDonald's uniform because that is what they have asked me to strip out of, and then to knock on the door to the break room. And so I put a thong on next to a rack of Big Mac buns, and it's not easy. I'm not trying to be grandiose about my situation in any way, but if you've ever tried to sort of put something into a Tupperware container, and as you're putting it in one side, it's popping out the other, <laughs> sort of what's happening to me next to the Big Mac one. It's a Happy Meal size thong, and it's not working out well. I managed to get it on uncomfortably. I head to the break room door, and I knock. As the door opens, Pam hits play on a boombox, and Madonna's Lucky Star begins playing. And I think, great, music makes everything better. I step into the room, and there's nothing better about this situation. It is a tiny room, and it is filled with women who I work with every day, including Lisa, the bride-to-be, who clearly, by the look on her face, does not realize I was going to be the stripper, and she's not happy about it, and now I am not either. It is one of those moments in your life when you've made a decision and now you know the decision is terrible, <laughs> but the only way to get out of it is to go through with it. And so I begin to strip. <laughs> I start with my shoes, the double bowed because that is who I am. When I finally manage to get them off, I don't know what to do with them. I've never actually been in a strip club except for this one of my own making. <laughs> I imagine like in a real strip club, the the stripper might throw the clothing out into the audience, but if I throw these shoes, like Lisa's right here, like she's just going to get popped right in the head. So I take the shoes and I put them neatly by the door because I need to get the hell out of here as quickly as possible. The next is a shirt. It's a button-down shirt. I go to pull it over my head, and as I do, I realize I have not unbuttoned the cuffs. And so as it comes over, it becomes this reverse straight jacket on me. And if you understand physics, you know that it is impossible to undo one of these buttons while it is reversed. So I actually have to put the shirt back on and then unbutton the cuffs and get it back off. And then I fold it neatly and put it on top of it. And then it's just the pants. They're the easiest to undo the belt buckle. Gravity does the rest. It is one of the hardest things I'm ever going to do. And so I pause for a moment, hoping maybe that this is the moment an asteroid strikes the Earth, <laughs> wipes out humanity, and the next moment does not have to happen. But the Earth continues to turn, human beings continue to live, and so I undo my belt and my pants drop to the ground. And the first thing I realize is this thong is fine, because the moment my pants hit the ground, everything in my body retreats. And now the song is like groomy. It is perfectly fine for me. But I am standing there in nothing but an orange song as Madonna plays. And I feel like the only thing I am supposed to do now is dance. Don't imagine it, please. <laughs> Don't put it in your mind in any way. Just know that a long time ago, a young man danced in a tiny room to a Madonna song while wearing a tiny orange song.
And when I was done, I gathered all my things. I headed back to the hallway to get changed. Pam meets me in the hallway. She hands me a check for $100, thus turning me into a professional stripper that night. <laughs> and as I'm leaving, I'm passing through the kitchen. I see my friend Brian Lowe. He's pulling filet of fish out of the back, and he's shaking his head at me. And I'm mad now. Like, I understand that that decision was not a good one, and the things that happened in that room should never be spoken of again. And now he's shaking his head at me, so I say, what? And he says, I just can't believe you did it. When they asked me, I said, no, like right away. <laughs> and I realized I was not the first choice. <laughs> and I will soon discover I was not the second or the third. I was the last choice. I was the idiot who said yes. <laughs> it is ridiculous to be upset about not being chosen first to strip at a bachelorette party in the crew room of a McDonald's restaurant. But I was upset. I thought for once in my life I was going to be the good-looking one, or a good-looking one, and it turned out not to be the case. And that really did upset me. The crazy thing about that story, other than it being tragically true, I still <laughs> <have that>. <laughs> <laughs> You never leave a soldier on the battlefield. <laughs> but why do I tell you that story? I first told that story to this woman, who eventually became this woman. And that was it. No one else in the world was ever going to hear that story. And then one day, a storytelling competition came up, and the theme was Mia Culpa. And my wife said, you have to tell the stripping story. And I said, I am never telling a stripping story to anyone in the world. It is the most shameful and embarrassing and ridiculous moment of my life. There's no way in hell I'm doing it. Three weeks later, I'm standing on a stage in New York City in front of 900 people getting ready to tell the story. And I am so angry. I'm angry at my wife for tricking me into doing this. I'm angry at myself for allowing it to happen. And then something miraculous happened. By the time Pam is handing me that thong in the story, the audience is laughing. And they're not laughing at me, they're not even laughing with me. It is just joyous laughter. And every bit of shame and embarrassment that I have been carrying for decades over that story, the power that that story held over me for all that time, was gone in an instant. <clears throat> we tell stories for lots of reasons, but one of the reasons we tell stories is because when we tell stories about our lives, the hard stories, the ones that are embarrassing and shameful and cringeworthy and awful, we strip them of their power forever. We stop walking through this world with baggage. We take those things that we once thought were embarrassing and shameful, and we discover that they're not actually as bad as we ever thought they were. We own our stories when we tell them. But the best news of all is that you don't need to stand in front of 900 people to make this magic happen. So it's three years later now, I'm in a different McDonald's. It's in Brockton, Massachusetts. I'm a customer this time, sitting in the dining room, eating a quarter pound of cheese. And I'm homeless. I'm homeless for a lot of reasons. I'm homeless because I don't have a family who can help me. I'm homeless because I've been arrested and I'm waiting trial for a crime I did not commit. I'm mostly homeless because the people who wanted to help me couldn't, and the people who could have helped me didn't. I'm also homeless because it's 1992, and if you want to get a job in 1992, you need to own a phone. And in order to own a phone, you have to have a wall to stick that phone on. In order to own a wall, you gotta have a roof, and a roof, you have to have a house. And I don't have any of those things, so I can't get work. I'm sitting in this McDonald's eating a quarter pound of cheese when Mary sits across from me. Mary is the sweetest old lady you'll ever meet. I actually hired her a couple years ago at this very McDonald's. She is kind, she's a born again Christian, she is goodness incarnate. She sits next to me and she says, Where are you living? And I tell her, I'm living with friends. And then she looks right through me. And she says, where are you really living? Somehow she knows. And so I tell Mary, I'm homeless. 
She's the first person I tell. I haven't even admitted it to myself. Mary tells me, you're coming home with me, and I say no. But in my heart, I say, thank God someone's going to save me. It's the easiest move of my life. Everything is already in the car. We show up at Mary's house. She gives me a room off the kitchen, a former pantry that's been converted into a bedroom. I share the room with a guy named Rick, another born-again Christian who speaks in tongues in his sleep. Rick and I share that room with Mary's indoor pet goat. <laughs> it was actually the goat room before we ever arrived, so we can't complain. But when that goat wants to play in the middle of the night, it will jam its tongue as far down my ear as it possibly can. I lie down on that bed the first night, a cot really. It is hard and lumpy and uncomfortable. And it's the best bed I have ever slept in in my entire life. For a long time, that story, that moment of my life, six weeks of homelessness and all, caused me so much pain. When I thought about it, I thought about failure and stupidity. It was like an infection that ran through my life. I thought about it all the time. And then one day, I decided to tell that story. A miraculous thing happened. The first thing I did was, I gave that story a beginning and an end. It stopped being my life and became a part of my life. I cut off the infection for the rest of my life. And for the first time in a long time, I gave that story a good hard look. I dared to see something that was painful. And when I did that, I found things I had never seen before. Things like the kindness of Mary and people like her who helped me off the street. I found grit and determination that I had never given myself credit for before. And suddenly it was plain as day. I took trauma and tragedy and I turned it into art. And then I told it to myself, your most important audience. Every story we tell, we tell to ourselves first. Because that's the only person we tell that story to it is still enormously valuable. But then I started telling it to other people. I went to my classroom and I told my fifth grade students the story of my homelessness. Then I shooed everybody out to recess. And one little girl came up to me and she told me that over the summer, she and her mom had been living in the car. They had an apartment now, but she had been worried that if they had to go back to the car, she might not be able to come to school anymore and learn. Telling that story to my students helped me relieve anxiety from a little girl who worried every day that she might not be able to come to school anymore. It helped me, it helped me help a family who was on their feet stay on their feet. The most important person we tell stories to is ourselves, but if we can be brave enough to tell our stories to other people, we can change lives in ways we never expect. And sometimes, the stories that we tell are lifelong stories. And so now it's December 29th, 1988. I'm standing in the middle of Main Street, but not Main Street, Blackstone, Massachusetts, where I'm growing up. Main Street, USA, Disneyland, Pasadena, California. I'm here in California with my high school marching band, and I'm standing next to my girlfriend, Laura, my high school sweetheart, the love of my life. We took separate planes to come on this field trip, so we made mixtapes for each other for the plane. When mixtapes were a serious piece of business, like a heavy lift, like really hard to do, like plastic cases, magnetic tape, your finger hovering over the record button, praying to God the DJ does not speak at the beginning of this song, my mixtape was perfection. Somewhere over America, I put Laura's tape into my Walkman, and I listened, but there was no Air Supply or Ario Speedwagon, no music whatsoever. It was Laura talking to me, telling me stories about her life, cracking jokes, reading Shel Silverstein poetry to me, and singing the Beatles yesterday poorly while the player piano in her living room banged away. Those two tapes were the epitome of our relationship. 
Laura wanted whimsy and romance and spontaneity, and all I was ever able to give her was planning and precision and exactitude. The Sunday before we left, I showed up at Laura's house unannounced, spontaneity, with a gift, flowers, romance, plastic flowers and a wicker basket. The look on her face said everything. The later she would tell me, Matt, nothing plastic is ever romantic. It was so bad that her, husband, her, her father, Butch, ran outside with a camera to take a picture of the moment. It's not good. <laughs> but here on Main Street, USA, I've got an answer to my prayers. I see it in a window. So when Laura goes to one shop, I go into another, and I purchase the solution to my problems. I show up on Main Street, and I hand them to her. Matching Mickey and Minnie t-shirts. Whimsy, romance, spontaneity. No. <laughs> the look on her face says it all. Now, that does not spell the end of my relationship with Laura. And in fact, if the things that don't end relationships at the end of high school didn't end ours, Laura and I might still be together today. But we stayed close friends, very, very close, until five years ago when she died of cancer. When I think about Laura, as I do very often, I am so grateful to her. I like to think that our first loves prepare us for our forever loves. I like to think that the ridiculousness and stupidity of young me, what Laura had to put up with, prepared me so that I could be the man who my wife deserves today. Now, here's the thing about that story. I didn't know any of that when I started working on that story. I knew that a long time ago on a street, I had some t-shirts and a look on a girl's face, and there was something there. But I didn't know what. But I did what I always do. I gave it a good, hard look. I dared to look at what I used to think of as stupidity and foolishness. And I found, instead, sweetness and youth. I found a way to smile about a friend who I've been missing for five years. I was reminded how important it is to think about our past, to bring sense to it, because past is prologue. Who we are today is the result of who we were yesterday. And if we're willing to look back and tell those stories, suddenly our todays will seem different and brighter. And we can look on our past not as something unfortunate and disappointing and stupid, but as important, something filled with meaning, something that brought us to the place we are today. We have to tell our stories, even if the only person you tell them to is yourself. I want you to leave this room today and tell a story. And maybe it's to yourself, but maybe you tell it to someone else too. Maybe it's one of those stories you've never told before, or one of those moments in your life that you're afraid to look at because it just seems so awful. I want you to look at it hard and see it for what it probably is. And I'm going to give you two things to do to tell that story, two ways to turn you into a better storyteller automatically, and it's just two words. I want you to think of these two words every single time you tell a story for the rest of your life, location and action. Start every story that you tell with location and action. Location because when you tell someone a location, instantly their mind's eye is activated. Their imagination is activated because locations become imbued with 1,000 adjectives already attached. <laughs> And action, because people want stories to get off the ground. They want it to get moving. They want to feel like they're going to some place. Location and action. I'm flipping burgers in a McDonald's restaurant. I'm eating a quarter pound of cheese in the dining room of a McDonald's restaurant. I'm standing on Main Street, USA, next to a girl who I love. Location and action will bring your story to life for the people who are listening to you. Tell your story. Please, tell your story. 
if you are brave enough and bold enough and smart enough and insightful enough to tell your stories, you will become a better version of you. The past will look better than it has ever looked before. And if you're lucky, you'll make someone's life better too. Tell your story.